Hello everyone, it's Mark Odeka here. Welcome to the NT Pod, the podcast all about the New Testament and Christian origins. Today in episode 10, we're going to be asking the question, did the Apostle Paul have a sense of humour? I don't know about you, but I'm always a bit wary of people who criticise others for not having a sense of humour. It's one of those things that people say when they just don't get on with somebody. They, they just don't like someone very much and they want to find a way of being mean about them. And they use the, they haven't got a sense of humour tag as, as, as a way of saying, well, they, they just aren't my kind of person. Well, one of the really curious things in biblical scholarship is that there's a scholar called John Knox who wrote a really interesting and really influential book called Chapters in a Life of Paul. And incidentally, it's a book I'd like to come back to in a future NT pod because very, very interesting for some of the issues that we're going to be talking about in the future. But there's a moment in Chapters in a Life of Paul where John Knox decides he's going to have a go at Paul for not having a sense of humour. Now, Knox's book was written in 1950, and the passage which I'm interested in, uh, it reads like this. He says, to be sure, Paul had serious limitations as a counsellor. We look in vain, he says, for any sign of humour in Paul's letters. He would have been both happier and wiser if he could sometimes have laughed at and with himself, and at and with others. Perhaps he did, but surely not often enough, since in that case, at least an occasional chuckle would have found its way into his letters. I think this charge is actually quite a serious one, because it's the scholar's way of saying, I don't really like this character very much, I don't really like Paul very much, at least I don't like him very much as a human being. Knox, in other ways, celebrates Paul's achievements, but he really feels that He himself, John Knox, isn't the kind of person that would want to have a drink with Paul or have a nice meal with him or share a good chat with him. But is John Knox right? Is there humour in Paul? Are are there some funny moments that we can find if we just look hard enough? I, I remember raising this question in a class once and a student saying to me, well, it stands to reason that there's no humour in the New Testament. He says, what do you think? These people are comedians? And I said, well... It's not implausible that when you're trying to persuade someone of your point of view that you might use humour, you might use jokes or funny lines to try and convey your point. And it's certainly the case that you can find dark humour in Paul. There's a very interesting and well-known case of this in the epistle to the Galatians. What happens here is that Paul is trying to dissuade his Galatian converts, the Gentiles in Galatia, of what he sees as a disastrous course of action, which is getting circumcised in order to seal their conversion to Christ. And what happens is Paul, when he's arguing against them, at one point really reaches a kind of crescendo of ridicule of what's going on and says, look, I wish that those people who are unsettling you, meaning the ones that are doing the circumcising, I wish that they would mutilate themselves, castrate themselves. And one nice paraphrase of this is, would that the knife would slip. Now, this is a really kind of dark thing to say, because he's saying, look, they've got the knife in their hand, and I wish they'd turn the knife on themselves. But that kind of qualifies, I think, as a sort of dark humour that's used as part of Paul's persuasion or attempts to get to the get home to the Galatians just how ridiculous he thinks that they're being. But what about other examples of humour in Paul? Well, he is able to use sarcasm, no question about that. If you look at 2 Corinthians, especially the last few chapters of 2 Corinthians, there are moments there where he really does sound quite sarcastic. I'll give you an example of one of them. In 2 Corinthians 12 verses 11 and following, he's really having a go at his Corinthian converts for not supporting him and instead supporting people that 
Paul characterizes as super apostles rather sarcastically. And he writes like this. He says, you've made me act like a fool boasting like this, because what Paul's been doing is he's been boasting of his own achievements. He says, you ought to be writing commendations for me, for I'm not at all inferior to these super apostles, even though I'm nothing at all. When I was with you, I certainly gave you proof that I'm an apostle, for I patiently did many signs and wonders and miracles among you. The only thing I failed to do, which I do in the other churches, was to become a financial burden. Please forgive me this wrong, he says. So you can see rather kind of a sarcastic tone, as we would call it, in this element of um, Paul's letters. But are the only examples of humour in Paul these kind of cases where we would say that the humour is rather barbed, where the humour has really quite a sharp edge to it? Well, I think there is a good example of some actual humour in Paul, something that I find at least quite amusing, and it's in 1 Corinthians 12. Now, in context in 1 Corinthians here, what he's doing is he's talking about spiritual gifts, in particular the gifts of tongues and prophecy. And it seems that what's happened is that people in the churches in Corinth have been arguing amongst themselves about the way to use spiritual gifts properly and some people are lording it over the other ones with their use of their particular spiritual gifts. And one of Paul's ways of tackling this is to say that the church is made up of many members of one body, the body of Christ. And so he then develops this metaphor, this symbol, by applying the way that different parts of a human body work together and trying to say that, trying to get to the kind of absurdity of the idea of members of the body of Christ arguing. So he writes like this, this is uh, from verse 14 in 1 Corinthians 12, for the body does not consist of one member but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of a body. I mean, already at this point, we have quite an enjoyable uh, absurdity where you have different parts of the body talking to other parts of the body and expressing themselves uh, in a way that is, is clearly absurd given that the body needs all these different things to function properly so he carries on in verse 17 if the whole body were an eye where would be the sense of hearing if the whole body were an ear where would be the sense of smell i mean i find myself here thinking of images of huge great big eyes bouncing around or huge great big ears bouncing around i think it's essentially a very using image. But as it is, Paul goes on in verse 18, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. So Paul ends that little bit of humour, that bit of absurdity in his symbol or his metaphor, and then gets to the key point that there are many parts of one body. But the humour in the passage still isn't quite done yet. If you look on at verses 22, 23 and 24, he starts talking about those elements in the body that have less honour and speaks about how the elements of the body that have less honour we treat with greater modesty and he talks about how we, we clothe them and look after them it's obvious what he's talking about here he's talking about the parts of the body that people don't normally in public get to see so he, he even in thinking about the body wants to use a little bit of discussion also about what he talks about as, as the kind of unpresentable part rather amusingly and rather euphemistically. So if I think we had something of a laughter track here, if we could actually hear the way that the Corinthians responded to this, as soon as they'd understood what was going on, I think they might well have had a laugh at the way that Paul is trying to ridicule the idea of the body of Christ together arguing with one another. I think it's an excellent image and I think it's Paul at his rhetorical best. Perhaps it's just me. I suppose ultimately what one would have to do is do a little bit of work on ancient attitudes to humour and that is a really difficult task given that, as is fairly obvious, we don't have any nice tapes or recordings from those days so we can't actually hear anybody laughing at anybody's jokes at any point.
Well, thanks very much for listening to the latest NT pod. It's been good to have your company. I look forward to seeing you again soon in the next episode. Um, if you want to look me out on the web, um, you can find me in various places. Probably the easiest way to get to me is just to go to my central hub, which is at markgoodacre.org. That's Mark Goodacre, um, my whole name, no spaces, O-R-G. Or just Google for me, and I'm sure that you'll land up somewhere. Oh, and this podcast is available on iTunes, Duke University's iTunes U, and so on. And if you really want to, you're welcome to follow me on Twitter, where my name is Goodacre. Thanks again for listening to the NT Pod, and I'll see you soon. Um, yeah, and, and St. Paul, he wrote letters, didn't he? St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Always writing to the Corinthians. St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Chapter 1, verses 1 to 53. Dear Corinthians, as you can tell from my preamble, it's going to be quite a long letter. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Don't do bad things, only do good things. Always treat your neighbour like someone who lives near to you. <laughs> Never put a sock in a toaster. <laughs> Never put jam on a magnet. <laughs> Never throw your granny in a bag. <laughs> Never suck all the juice out of a vampire. Never lean over on a Tuesday. <laughs> uh, Lots of other things, but I've got to go and have a Mars bar now. Love. Love, Paul. Brackets, saint. 